when you were describing conscientiousness, I was thinking, okay, so someone is conscientious, uh, they're not gonna, they're gonna wait for the green man to cross the road, they're gonna go and see the doctor when they're sick. Are you talking about someone then who just follows rules? Because I guess, and I, I've read your previous book, uh, and I know you talk a lot about creativity. And, you know, there's so many benefits to being creative and, uh, I guess, challenging a lot of the assumptions that are already there in society and actually, you know, sort of navigating your way around that. Is, is there a clash there somewhere? Can you be someone who is highly conscientious, but is also very creative and willing to challenge things? Well, I believe so. Uh, do you see what I'm getting at? I do, yeah. Because I, I, conscientiousness, although rule following is a part of it, it's not all of it. Yeah. And there are cases where you really have to not follow a rule. Um, if, um, if you're starving and uh, you see a roll, I mean, really starving, you're about to die, and you see a roll left out on a table in a restaurant that hasn't been picked up yet, I would say you're morally and ethically justified to pick up that roll even though you didn't pay for it. Uh, there are all these kinds of thought experiments about ethics. Um, I think that if you had the opportunity to murder Hitler, murder is supposed to be against the rules, but you know, there's a, an argument to be made that that would have been a good thing to do. So, and, and these aren't, I'm not talking about creative acts here. I'm talking about more practical ones. But uh, I think of the people I know, Joni Mitchell's a good example, one of the most creative people I know. And She's very conscientious, uh, although she breaks all kinds of rules with her songwriting and her painting. She's a wonderful painter. Um, the way the conscientiousness shows up is she finishes what she starts. She'll spend months working on a single line of a song to get it just right. That's a kind of stick to itiveness. And um, she's happy to break rules in songs for one thing. She doesn't use standard guitar tunings like yeah. everybody else does. She invents her own. Interestingly, she this is not well known, but the reason she did it is because she had polio as a child. She doesn't have full, I can tell you this because you're a guitarist, she doesn't have the full strength of her left fingers to be able to make conventional chords. For the most part, she can only play two strings at once, kind of like Django Reinhardt. So she invents these tunings that allow her to basically take two fingers and move them up and down the neck. I would say that's an interesting case of rule breaking and conscientiousness. Yeah, I mean that it's super interesting. That that reminds me of um, I don't know if you heard of a band called Crowded House. <laughs> sure, Neil Finn. Yeah, I Neil love Finn. Crowded House. Yeah, they, they were one of my favorite oh, bands in the nineties. Yeah, I, I've seen them a few times play. Don't dream it's over. Yeah, there is reason within. Yeah, exactly. There is reason without. It's such a great track. Yeah. Um, um, My uh, friend Mitchell Froome plays the organ on it, the B3 organ. Oh, really? Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, I know it well. It's amazing. Oh, I mean, well, th this conversation could fast go down a track of music, which I'm going to go down for a little bit because I'm super interested. The B3 is one of my favorite sounds, I think, out of all musical sounds. I absolutely love it. And when it's just sitting there in the background, it's, it's just Beautiful. And I think that Mitchell managed to get it as close to the timbre and the sound of um, um, Booker T. Yeah. Uh, Booker T. Jones. Uh, I think he, he managed to get that sound, the, the Booker T sound, Green Onions and all that. And it's hard to do. It's it's all in the draw bars and it's in the the micro adjustments you make with touch. Yeah. But man, I mean, he well, nailed it. it. It's, yeah. I mean, I mean, but, I mean and on, on Crowded House, um, what was relevant in my head based upon what we said about Joni Mitchell is that I remember seeing an interview with Neil Finn once and he's, uh, he's uh, you know, not verbatim, but he says something like, you know, we're a four piece band. So our limitations become our strength. So he was all from, from certainly my interpretation of what I heard was that we're going to only record stuff or play live stuff that we can do, the four of us. So we're going to have to create around that rather than bringing in extra people to be able to play this part or that part or that part. It's the opposite of a latter-day Beatles or Steely Dan approach. Yeah. They're a live band like you too. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's fascinating that Joni also, because she's she's got a limitation that lends, that, that gives her some new creativity because if she didn't have that, maybe she would play in standard tuning and therefore she might not be as crazy. Who knows? But it's, it's super interesting. But I guess, Dan, we are talking about aging well and the brain. 
and you've written a book on music and the brain. Um, so I'm interested, does music play a role for us in terms of how we're aging? Well, um, yes and no. Um, we now believe that 5% of the population are, sorry for a buzzword, but anhedonic for music, meaning they, they don't get pleasure from music. And, you know, this just due to genetic variation or environmental factors. Uh, we see anhedonia, failure to receive pleasure in many domains. Some people don't like chocolate. Some people don't like sex. Uh, or being touched. Some people don't like music. But for the rest of us who do, um, there are some interesting connections between music and aging, uh, some of which are well known. Uh, if you've got Alzheimer's or uh, extreme dementia, and you no longer recognize where you are or who your friends are, you don't recognize yourself in a mirror, in many, many cases, you still recognize songs from your youth. They're preserved. And this is not just kind of a, um, a cool fact. It's an essential part of adults living with uh, cognitive impairment in, um, in relaxing them or causing them to be less agitated. Imagine what it's like if you look in the mirror, you don't recognize who it is, you were put in some home or facility after your memory impairment started, so you don't know where you are, uh, you don't recognize the caregivers who come in every single day, um, and often we see in these patients, as you well know, a great deal of agitation and uh, anger, and of course they're angry, they don't know where they are, but you put on the headphones, the earbuds, whatever, you play them a song from when they were 14 years old, they suddenly reconnect with themselves, there's home. There's something in their memory that they recognize, and that's who I am. This is, this is something I can get a hold of. And we find that in these cases, the, the patients as well as their families are tremendously relieved. Now, that's sort of an extreme case of music. Um, a less extreme case that's not as well known is that older adults who start to learn an instrument, or if they already play a new instrument, that learning is neuroprotective. One of the many myths that I try to bust in The Changing Mind is that uh, you can't grow new neurons after a certain age, or you can't make new neural connections. Neuroplasticity, the buzzword for making new neural connections, new synapses, that goes on your entire life. And the more you can learn, especially new things, the more neuroprotective it is because you're building up neural and cognitive reserves. So... That could be anything there, right? You just learning anything, whether it's music or sport or Absolutely. You know, but is a it a new bit, language? So this sounds like one of the key things we need to be thinking about as we get older is what keep trying new things. Yeah, and in particular, there's this new appreciation for what we call embodied cognition. Uh, Barbara Traversky and Scott Grafton both have new books out about this. Scott's is called Physical Intelligence. Uh, fantastic books. The idea is that your body actually helps your mind grow through the experiences you have manipulating your body. So learning a new language is neuroprotective, but learning something that involves eye-hand coordination, um, musical instruments being one, not so much singing, but playing an instrument, or, or taking up tennis, or, or ping pong, or you know anything that involves this kind of body intelligence. Very powerful is simply going for a walk on an uneven trail. As you probably know, some Scottish doctors are now writing prescriptions yeah. for their patients. Go for a walk outside. You know, uh, it's because as you're walking on an uneven surface, your foot and your ankle and your legs are and your vestibular system are making dozens of micro adjustments every minute. Uh, you have to change the pressure and the angle and you have to get feedback about what's happening so you don't fall over. And it's hugely important. So would you say that, you know, would you therefore not be recommending as people age that they work out in a gym, on a treadmill, or on an exercise bike? Or can you do a bit of both? Well, you can certainly do a bit of both. Uh, I've, I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I've changed a few things in my own life. One was I didn't know about sarcopenia, 
how would I, I as I say, I, I basically know about stuff from the chin up uh, and a little bit of spinal cord. But sarcopenia is to muscle what osteoporosis is to bone. And um, so I've started doing resistance training. I go to the gym. I'm not trying to bulk up like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I do a round of 20, uh, sorry, 12 different weight machines just to keep my muscles going. I spend about 40 minutes there four or five times a week. Jane Fonda has started, told me she started doing the same thing. Um, do you enjoy I, it? I do. I do. I can't, I couldn't tell you why, but I do. And I also do the elliptical because I'm trying to get my heart rate up and I do what's called high intensity interval training. But better than both of those really is the difference between sedentarism and moving outdoors. If you only do one thing, you should move outdoors. But yeah, adding the others is great. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great because... There's a lot of information we're giving people and sometimes getting too many things to do, too many things that are great to do, can sometimes seem a bit overwhelming. You have to prioritize. Now, if you're in a wheelchair, get somebody to take you out. The visual stimulation of being in nature is neuroprotective, not as much as if you're walking. And if you can push your own wheelchair, even better, or yeah. walker. Yeah. Now, Dan, you've got a long history in music, haven't you? You're a music producer as well? Yes. Yeah. And I heard you on an interview recently talk about you had the opportunity to meet Sting once and you scanned his brain. Yeah. So I'm interested, you know, Sting, well, I don't know how old Sting is, but... He's a few years older than me. I'm 62. I think he's 67-ish. Yeah. So look, I haven't seen a picture of Sting for a while, but the last time I saw him, certainly there's no way I would have guessed that he was in his late 60s. It's clearly someone who seems to be aging very well. So... Sting has a lot of practices, certainly that come across in the media that we read about. How many of those are true? That I don't know. But when the you... The tantric sex is not true, for That's example. It's not true? No. Okay. Um, do you know what he does? I do. Wise? I do. Um, Sting had read This Is Your Brain on Music, and he reached out to me at some point in 2007 or eight and said he wanted to visit the lab and meet me and talk about the findings. And so he came to Montreal, and I said, you know, while you're here, if you want, we can scan your brain and we can, you know, see what it looks like. Um, it wouldn't be an actual s study. I guess it, it's a case study, but not a proper experiment. Uh, and he was into it. And, uh, you know, we, we found that his corpus callosum is thicker than most people's. That's the fiber track that connects the left and the right hemisphere. And we often see thicker corpus callosi in people who are very creative, who are shuttling information from the left to the right hemisphere. Um, we learned some things about how he organizes music in his memory that were quite novel. We published a paper about it, Scott Grafton and I, the embodied cognition guy, in a, a journal called NeuroCase. It's available for free on my website, as all my peer-reviewed papers are. Okay, great. Um, and we'll link to all of them sure. uh, as well in the show notes section so people can easily find that. Uh, I mean, it is an article written for other scientists, but I think that the average person could glean the, the punchline from it. Uh, and then he, uh, we, we kind of got, we got, we got along well, and he invited me to come and tour with him and the police reunion tour for a few shows. You've got to be kidding me. It was terrific. <laughs> Um, oh, wow. And so I did get to see what his life is like. Uh, he does yoga every afternoon. He has, uh, you know, for at least a couple of hours, sometimes four. He uh, earmarks alone time apart from the yoga to either practice something musically or learn a new song or... Uh, or write something just to experiment around. He gives himself play, time to play every day when he's on tour. And then the other extraordinary thing was, we were talking about conscientiousness. I've never met anybody with the work ethic that he has. And, uh, you know, I... I'm, I'm a, a professor. I know a number of Nobel Prize winners. Most of the professors I know are workaholics. We work 75, 80 hours a week. That's nothing compared to what Sting does. He is working all the time. He enjoys himself, uh, but he, his work ethic, just to give you an example, I asked him, how is it that you play bass and sing at the same time? I'm a bass player. That's very difficult to do because sure. it's not like strumming a guitar or finger picking where everything's in sort of lockstep time. Bass parts tend to be syncopated. You're not, you're not always singing when the bass hits a note. You're sometimes yeah. singing in between notes and in odd inter integer ratios. Uh, and so just as 
as a demonstration of work ethic, I said, how do you do it? He says, well, he says, when I know that I'm going to go out on tour and I'm going to have to play these songs in the studio. Yeah, you can track it differently. Yeah, he played the bass first, he sang second or vice versa. If he's going to have to do it live. So he writes out on a piece of paper the lyrics and the, the chords or the notes and he writes a kind of visual map for where the vocal note is versus the bass notes. Sometimes they're synchronized, sometimes they're anti-phase. And then he'll sit down and he'll practice one measure at about one-fifth the normal tempo. And he might do that for half an hour, that one measure. And then he'll put it away and go to another song, and the next day he'll come back and he'll add another measure. And he says it could take him six months to work up a tune at the proper tempo. And I thought, wow. oh my God. Is it, is it a bit like, you know, some, again, I'm not trying to compare the two, but just to sort of make it really relevant for people at home who maybe are not musical or don't play the bass and are never try to play the bass and sing at the same time. You know, like, I'm sure it's the same in America. We have the saying where you have to try and um, patch your stomach and, sorry, you know, uh, put your hand around your stomach and pat your head at the same time, which some people find quite hard to do unless you... But I think most people, when they focus on it and practice... Well, it requires what we call limb independence. Yeah, so yeah. is there something similar to that that's going on with Sting when he's trying to just teach him, maybe not limb independence, but, you know, voice and hand independence? Yeah, and, and we find this in a lot of activities. Flying an airplane requires limb independence. You're using both feet, you're using both hands. Um, one of the things I did in order to... Uh, uh, adopt the advice that I gave others in the book is that I realized I had to push myself out of my comfort zone. And so I took flying lessons and studied for my private pilot's license because it is very complicated. It's not like playing drums. So, so, it's a, you're doing this to help you age better. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, Bec I, because it's a new skill and it's, it's sort of taxing your brain you're, and your brain's having to fire up different neurons. Yeah. Is that in a nutshell what it is? It's exactly that. It was taxing my brain in ways I hadn't taxed it before. Yeah. Not only that, but I'm, I'm terribly afraid of heights. And yeah. so it was a way for me to get some agency over my own yeah. uh, feelings in life. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here.